Welcome to Five Strike Weekly, everyone. Atlanta United got the win, but we're far from convincing against the league's basement dwellers. Can they build off that performance and get a big three points on the road against Sporting Kansas City? We break all that down and more, coming up. Welcome to the show of Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ, this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become a member of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube or hop over to Facebook and subscribe. You can now also find all our content on the Jinico USA platform anywhere in the world on Amazon Fire TV, Roku, iOS, Google Play, and many other streaming platforms. So guys and gals, on a whole, Colorado came in and did something kind of not usual for them. They pretty much sat in two deep blocks and a five and four park that bus really, really deep. And I think it aimed to frustrate us. And you can see why, I mean, you know, Atlanta United, not in the best of form. You can see how they wouldn't be able to maybe break this down as easily as they have in the past. Uh, not that it was easy in previous seasons either, but, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, our confidence lacking, I think it kind of, you know, leads to why uh, this scoreline was, you know, not really the most spectacular. And if we had more confidence in our finishing, I think we would probably be able to maybe see the, the score lines of old with like the five nils and seven ones of uh, yesteryear. But I think all in all, you know, uh, we still got the ugly win. We got the three points and we did what we needed to do to get that first home win of the season. But yes, a lot to improve on still. Yeah, thankfully you didn't give away an early goal, so that's improvement off the get-go. Exactly. Colorado had its chances as well. They had two shots on target in the first half. Mm -hmm. Both were better opportunities than what Atlanta United managed to muster, which was just an LGP speculative effort from distance. Right. But that first half for me was one of the worst halves of football I've watched. Whether or not that team, the team comes in with no intention of playing and parks two buses really, yeah. Atlanta United were not good on the ball. There was no movement going forward. There was a lack of ideas. There was a lack of incision. I would think that Frank DeBoer would have anticipated this and would have instructed his players to play the ball quickly, to have movement, to take the ball, pass the ball, move, take the ball, pass the ball, move. Too often, it was take the ball, sit, wait for someone to move, no move, pass it sideways, backwards, recycle, repeat, and then hopeful chip ball into the box, and they're sitting so deep that that's never gonna work. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was frustrating, and yes, it, it makes complete sense as to why Colorado would adopt that approach coming in. Mm -hmm. They've been conceding three goals a match almost every single match this season. They've not been good at all defensively. But that being said, even though they were sitting deep, I thought Atlanta had had enough quality to be able to take advantage of that, make them make mistakes, mm -hmm. force the issue. And I didn't think they did a very good job in the first half. Yeah. It was improved upon in the second half, uh -huh. but- they, they definitely played with more urgency and. Probably the halftime talk had something to do with it, where they, uh, you know, started to play with a little bit more uh, urgency, with a little bit more pass and move. But, but why can't you come out that way? Is my question. Oh sure. You, if you know they're going to do that, come out that way. Come out firing out of the blocks and try to get a goal early, because the sooner you score, if you score in the first half, Atlanta United you have a chance of really making that big score line. Because if you score earlier, then that goal is in their head and they know they're gonna eventually have to come out. The goal eventually came, but you still felt that Atlanta United didn't have any ideas moving forward. And that was frustrating for me to watch because it seemed, some people may say improved, mm -hmm. but for me personally, I didn't see that improvement till later in the second half. And it's not acceptable when you have as much talent as Atlanta United does against a team as poor, parking the bus or not in Colorado, mm -hmm. to not make more of an effort, to only generate one shot on target in the first half and it be a 30 yard speculative effort from a center back. Yeah, well, I think the other part of that is, you know, they couldn't have exactly expected that they were going to absolutely sit in two deep blocks coming out of the gate because that's not what they've done the entire season, right? But it and is so, what teams do at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Yes, yes, but the difference is, is that when you have a team that, you know, isn't known for doing that, and, you know, you have them come in, you can't always expect that and then play to exactly how you're supposed to play against that when you haven't maybe trained for that. So, yes, again, though, I, I agree that they, they should have played faster, They, but you know, they only were instructed to, and then they actually started doing it. So, you know, of course, sure, maybe Frank DeBoer could have been saying that off the uh, the bench and started saying that, but 
you know, was the, the message actually going to be able to be, you know, uh, strong enough to where they actually could do that on the pitch? Probably not. And that's probably why nothing happened. Like, do you think that, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, someone says off, something off the bench and immediately they can just implement it? I mean, no, no, absolutely. You know, and I mean, from, from all everything I've ever heard, it's very difficult for players to receive an instruction off the bench during the game. But for me, you know, not to toot my own horn here, but mm -hmm. you know, I pinged exactly how Atlanta were gonna set up this game. Yeah. For me, it made sense. But I don't think it's too much of a shout to anticipate that Colorado are going to play sure. that negative because they would not be the first team mm -hmm. to do that. And for a team that has given up three goals, four goals, four goals, and three goals mm -hmm. in their previous four matches, mm -hmm. it would not be a very large gamble to assume that that is going to be the way that they are going to play because teams that are better than them have done that. They are sure. on the bottom of MLS for a reason, conceding almost three goals a game. There is a reason for that. They're not gonna come into Mercedes-Benz Stadium, even if Atlanta are in poor form, mm -hmm. and try to play open and again, attacking football against them, or even play higher up the pitch, because that is suicide. That is how you get housed. Oh, sure. And, and so I don't think that it's a leap to assume that mm -hmm. you could anticipate that going in. And for me, that's what was so frustrating, is that you basically wasted 45 minutes because you couldn't anticipate what your opponent was going to do when it wasn't a very, large stretch of the imagination to mm -hmm. see them doing that. Yeah, and I think, you know, by no stretch of the imagination, if they had, then the scoreline would have been a little bit more lopsided, for sure. But I think, you know, looking at the facts is that, yes, they came out of the, the gates slow, they couldn't figure it out, they, uh, and, yeah, two low blocks is incredibly difficult to uh, kind of figure out, because, yes, I mean, some of the biggest teams in the world have to deal with that. You know, a Barca, a Bayern Munich, you yeah, know, Manchester City, exactly. PSG. And so it's it's you know something that is not unique to Atlanta United. And uh, what we had to deal with, yeah, I mean, you know, the best teams and the best players fail to break down those teams, and you know, are able to make those lopsided uh, score lines. It's usually the teams that are able to play very open and you know are not sitting so deep that those lopsided scores actually do happen so like against a lafc um you know they wanted to come out they want to play and that's why they can <clears throat> excuse me they can uh get beat a five nil um you know or if there's kind of what probably should have happened in this match there probably should have been an early card on Wilson when he pretty much went studs into Jeff Lawrence's leg. And yep. uh, the fact that he was still on the pitch, that baffled me. Par for the course though. With yeah. how things have been going, if you're an Atlanta head player and you get studs to the ankle or leg, you're probably not gonna see that guy's a dog. New England Revolution, anybody? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I get that it's early, but it's still one of those things that like, you know, and it probably would have killed the match in terms of, it, they would have already sat deep, they would have sat even deeper somehow. They would have somehow. pulled Kai Kamara somehow and just managed to put him in the box as an auxiliary defender. Exactly, and yeah, so I, it would have been even uglier if he had been, but either way, I mean, you know, I think this type of match, uh, you kind of look in a vacuum, probably, because it's not- Yes and no, though. I, I think it's this. What you look at it in a vacuum is how they played in the first half because they didn't figure it out, okay? But they eventually figured it out in the second half, right? And so when they actually did, then you can see the positives of what's coming out of but that But what match. was so different from what Colorado did versus from what Cincinnati did? Cincinnati did the same thing. They sat really deep. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia sat really deep. Even though they pressed, mm -hmm. Dallas also is really good at sitting really deep. This is a consistent thing. This mm -hmm. was a problem even under Tata Martino, sure. which was a different style of play. Mm -hmm. Frank DeBoer knows this. He is an experienced manager. Mm -hmm. He has managed in some of the biggest leagues in the world, mm -hmm. has played at some of the biggest leagues in the world, and even talked about at halftime how this happened to him at Barcelona. Sure. Which means he knew he had to have known that this mm -hmm. is what was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And the team still woefully unprepared to attack or make any inroads against this team. That's why you have technical players, even yep. though they are sitting deep. That's why you have Ezekiel Barco. I think what's That's different. why you bring in a PT Martinez, mm -hmm. who was wasteful on the ball in the first sure. half. I, Joseph I think, Martinez, bracketed, no mm -hmm. movement. I mean, there was nothing from Atlanta United at all. The difference is, you know, you have guys that are finally coming back into full fitness. 
Uh, match fitness, really, that's what's important. PT Martinez still hasn't played a full 90 in a long time. That's uh, sure. You have issues with uh, the fullbacks in terms of what they're needing to do. I think Franco Escobar coming in definitely offers that something different. Someone that's but in, that first a game willing back runner. struggled definitely. Exactly. Struggled at times, but was able to, like, he, I think he struggled with his uh, final ball and his final touch. But in terms of making those runs and uh, definitely defending, one-on-one -on -one defending, he was very stout still. Like, it was Franco Escobar of old where he wasn't pissing you off. Uh, <laughs> hey, but... hey, towards the end of last season, I was praising the hell I mean. out of that guy. Yeah. It wasn't early days where he was just, up, oh yeah, like you know, FC Dallas. Right, and so, <laughs> you know, there's stuff like that where there are the, the positive signs and definitely, uh, even towards later in the match, yeah, like, we still had the... Uh, you know, the fitness in the match, I think, because, yeah, Colorado was chasing and they were having to... It's also to... easy to have fitness when your tempo is so slow, though. Sure. I mean, in the first half, again, mm -hmm. how many times did the ball get played into the wings and get played into a cul-de-sac and there was yeah. nowhere to go? And it was still... That was the problem. It was still high enough up the yeah. pitch to where it was like, how can we not create space? It, because too we, often... didn't, we didn't have... Uh, the width for one where we had it was the fullback though Escobar would be wide and we he didn't have enough get or, overloads and so like that that for me like there aren't enough combinations to get us higher on the pitch there's just guys out there and then they're isolated and they don't have anywhere to go and so you know you see a Brecce having to pass back you see you know that type of uh things that are really, really agitating everybody, right? But, I thought Brex actually had a decent game. And exactly, yeah. Like, he is much maligned by the, the fan base, by most of the fan base. And yeah, he had a couple of very, very good balls, especially near the end when he was subbed off. There was a ball in the sixth that, you know, if someone, I think in, you know, uh, in the form of last year, someone would have put that away. Uh, but, you know, it was a dangerous ball, you know, where it was where Tim Howard couldn't get to it. If somebody, and a center back didn't get to it, if somebody had made that run and had that timing, you know, it, this would have been a lot different. But um, yeah, I mean, yes, it's still, we are not uh, finishing. We're not there in terms of uh, the rhythm, the confidence, the conviction. Creating and, good chances still isn't there. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, those are those are kind of half chances, right? And so in terms of them, if they, if they finish them, then they look a lot better. Right. Of course. But at the end of the day, you still only managed three shots yes. on target in the whole match, and mm -hmm. so did Colorado. And oh, they yeah. they only had five chances, and you had 15. Mm -hmm. You had, what, 63% possession? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you. It, the other thing is, is Atlanta United didn't even have as much possession as I anticipated. I expected yeah. Atlanta to have 75, upwards of 75, Yeah, you said 80%. about 80%. I thought that they were going to have 66, a lot more. 66, something like that. Colorado sure. had more possession than I anticipated, so it, they can't be completely accused of parking the bus because It was, I they, think, a little later on. They, they had they, chances. They came out because yes. they, they knew that, okay, now we actually have to come out and at least try to get a result. And so it But they made some inroads in the first half. The first 10, 15 minutes, they looked the more dangerous team. It was a little bit more where they were trying to, you know, uh, hit us on the counter and get, you know, uh, yes, those, those chances were the best chances of the match by far in the first half. Like we it might have been the best, match, the best chances of the match the whole time because sure. at the end of the day, the goal comes from an error and a miscommunication between sure. the defender and the goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had probably the better of the chances mm -hmm. and they came on the break and Kai Kamara was throwing his weight around on the yep. first half and they had, there were chances when they had pushed men up the field or had had a higher line yeah. and Atlanta United would not make that counter attack like they mm -hmm. would last year. Exactly. It was too often, it was too slow. let's hold it. And that's something that I don't understand. When you have, I understand controlling the possession. That's a dysfunction, I think, within the team. I think there are players that want to play very quickly, uh, like a Nagby, like a Barco, uh, at times. You know, they, they do want to make, you know, very, very uh, kind of quick movements into their box. But then you have guys on the wings, maybe, or uh, that just, you know, are in sync with everything and I think that's the problem. And that's another criticism I have of the manager yeah, if they don't sure. understand that because mm -hmm. possession is all fine and well mm -hmm. but if the team, the opposition team has now come out and created space from you, mm -hmm. take advantage of that. Yes. Manchester City Agreed. will do that. Ajax will do that. Sure. Even if you want to be a possession team, if the space is there, play it. How many yeah. times does it let to do a Taylor Twelman, how many times does Atlanta United get the ball and eventually gets bored of what they want to do and you have a chip ball into the box from an LGP or someone after the defense has already settled on the 18th? Right, exactly. As opposed to doing that when they are 15 to 20 yards higher up the pitch when you could actually play that ball over the top and uh -huh. there's a landing zone, Joseph Martinez isn't getting there. 
Also, Joseph Martinez isn't even making that run because he knows the ball isn't going to get there. Yeah. At many times in the first half, you would have the front three or the front four just standing in a line, not moving. That's not offering any options. Again, yeah. that comes back to the manager clearly not making it very apparent what he mm -hmm. wants from them. Why is Joseph Martinez picking the ball up at the halfway line? He's the best goal scorer in MLS with the most goals in a single season. Why is he playing with his back to goal on the halfway line against a team that at this point in time had their line higher yeah. on the pitch? He's a guy that needs to be getting in the box. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm still frustrated by this performance because they were not a, they're not a good enough team for it to be one nil, oh, we improved. Mm -hmm. No, this should have been a match with the month that's coming up where Atlanta United went out and put a performance and a result together to get some confidence because that's what you need when you go to Sporting Kansas City, mm -hmm. when you play at home against a top of the table Toronto, when you play at home against a rival in Orlando. You have to have confidence against those to take those chances in those big moments. This was a game that offered an opportunity for those players to put in a shift and feel like, okay, now we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you took six out of nine points after this three game stretch against New England, Dallas, and Colorado. And on the whole, your best performance is against New England. And even so, it was okay. Yeah, but okay, well, before we get to the at the end of the day stuff, I mean, that's like, okay, still, against Colorado, like why we didn't concede early is because we didn't take the risks, which is good and also bad. And because they didn't take which, their chances. Because yeah. had they taken oh, their sure. chances, it landed and would have been one nil down in the first exactly. 10 minutes of that match again. And so that's kind of what it is, is that, you know, you you have to kind of have both too. Uh, you, I mean, you can't have both. Is uh, I mean, essentially what uh, kind of happens is, you know, if you play a little bit safer and you don't take that uh, ultimate risk to try to score early, then you, that's like, you can't have both. We're like, not having either right now because oh, exactly. we're not taking risk and we're giving away yeah. chances. And, and so, but that's the problem is, you know, if you're not taking those risks, you probably aren't going to get a, you know, a chance to score a goal that, uh, you know, probably is a little easier to score than some of the speculative chances that we've had. Right. And so that is, you know, you, you kind of, you know, we're not, uh, we're not clinical, you know, in the beginning, and we're, you know, having to, to chase it at the end. Where, you know, finally though, Frank de Boer, he makes a move. Uh, Probably his best substitution yeah, of the season. Yeah, two two substitutions that actually I think uh, really make a huge, huge difference. And also Nagby. Uh, some were saying that he's he moved out to uh, you know left back, but I think that's only later on because where he was picking the ball up and where he was actually uh operating it was in the middle of the park like he still was uh but yes it did. was more off the left though yeah, on he, the left side when he when he picked it up it was on the left side uh but in terms of him operating no it was definitely when uh tito first came on yeah he was still in the middle he was still you know uh making the passes from uh where he usually does but you know tito coming on it really did change the match because he was able to not only press their uh, their back line into making that mistake. So when they make that mistake, uh, you know, number two passes it and it almost telegraphs what he's going to do and Nagby, you know, knows exactly where that passing lane is, you know, catches into it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, he makes a very beautiful run uh, to the byline, which I love because that's what we need to do a lot yes. more. Yes, uh, And because it causes a lot of chaos, the, you know, that you draw out their defenders, which is exactly what happened. And then Julian Gressel, very in a poaching mentality, uh, you know, makes a very smart run to the near post and in a small window is able to get it past Tim Howard. And we finally get that breakthrough, which Absolutely. is fantastic. Um, it's something that, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we saw a lot more of these type of goals last year where, you know, a Tito and a Joseph would maybe be on the end of those. So, I mean, you know, more of these and obviously, you know, dynamism in our attack is what is needed as well. But I think, uh, you know, that's what we've lacked this season is that running to the byline. That goal was exactly how this team should be playing. Yeah. And I do not understand for the life of me why it is impossible for them to do that for minute one. 
because mm -hmm. that was the perfect press from Tito. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where Darlington Nagby should be. That's what you should get from your midfielders is to be able to make those combinations because mm -hmm. when you also have a fullback that can overload that side, now you have three players, you have your triangles, you have a, a midfielder making a run inside of the fullback, mm -hmm. getting to that byline, making that cross, creating those opportunities. You have another midfielder making a run to the post. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even Joseph. Usually you'd expect Joseph to take that chance, mm -hmm. like you said. That's how this team should play. Mm -hmm. Why can they not do that more often from the get-go? Because that's what they need to do. They have it in their DNA. They're athletic. Right. They want to do that. Let it's, them do that. And it was also, yeah, a goal that probably was coming. I mean, it, it was, you know, PT Martinez, uh, yeah, was subbed off. And yes, there's the incident where you see uh, PT, you know, subbed off. He's upset. He's... Uh, jawing with Frank de Boer, he's kicking the chair that Breck Shea is sitting on, and Breck Shea uh, looks back, and I mean, I, I don't think there's really much to it, uh, and Breck Shea also like consoles him after the, the second time. I mean, yeah, I, I for me actually am totally cool with seeing this, like it means there's fire from the player. Uh, is it the best look? Probably not. But, uh, you know, I think from a player that is frustrated and uh, has, like, no, no like, actual, like, uh, filling up the stat sheet in terms of that, like, he's not been, uh, you know, filling it up, it's something that, yeah, I want to see that he cares. Because if he's subbed off early, whether it was because, you know, maybe he's on a minute count or because he wasn't uh, playing the best, but I think right before, you know, a couple of crosses, that really could have been on the end of, uh, you know, if Joseph had, you know, of yesteryear in that form, he probably would have gotten the end of that. Uh, if he had not dove and instead tried to run onto it, he probably would have scored. I mean, I think there's kind of in baseball, uh, there is that, um, you know, kind of thing where if you are running to first and you dive to first, it's actually slower than if you just ran through it. Right. You yes. know, and so it's sort of that same mindset. If Joseph had just, you know, finished off the run, he probably would have scored. And so it's just a lack of confidence. And I think you kind of saw that a lot this this match where he was diving to the ball instead of maybe, you know, making the, the you know, finishing run to it to, to be able to, to finish it. But. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was critical of PT in my post-match fan cam. I said I don't know what he does for this team right now, and I still think that's a fair assessment to make. Mm -hmm. That being said, you know, going through some of the comments, especially on Mark's fan cam, you know, there's River fans talking about how it took him a while to settle in at River. Apparently they set his car on fire, positives that shouldn't happen here. But for me personally, I, I felt that he's a good enough player. He's older now than when he moved to River. He's sure. coming off a successful season. Mm -hmm. I, maybe the expectations were too high, but when you are the reigning South American player of the year, I don't think it's you know uncalled for to expect him to be able to come in and be no, able to, not, but, to contribute. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, even Tata Martino talked about how players need time to develop. Mm -hmm. So this is something that, yeah, he did create those chances. Yes, he is frustrated. It will take time. And to, but, to talk on that, where uh, yeah, Tata Martino, he talked about like the likes of Miguel Miron and Joseph Martinez when they came on in 2017, they pretty much started off pretty hot because it was pretty much the second match where they, you know, they scored. They blitz Minnesota. Exactly. It was a brace and a hat trick, you know, uh, respectively with Miguel Miron and Jose Martinez. And so, you know, like that definitely eases the fans' fears a lot quicker than if you struggle for a few games. And so, yeah, right now, you know, he's going through what I think a lot of players struggle through. And hopefully that's the end of it. And there aren't any more excuses about, uh, you know, PT Martinez. Like, yeah, I mean, he's gotten closer to a 90 minute run out. And so once he's closer to that, I mean, yeah, the expectations should be there. And so, you know, it's up to him to produce. Yes, he's, you know, visibly upset, but I think really, it's not really, uh, for me, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me either. I mean, again, it shows that he cares. It shows, but it, it does show that he's frustrated. Will he come good? He's talented enough. Yeah. I don't know right now because there's all the rumors circling off the field. It doesn't seem like he's maybe necessarily settled in Atlanta yet. So we'll see, but he's a good player. He's a quality player. He will be necessary 
if Atlanta United want to succeed in anything this year because yep. you can't get rid of Miguel Almiron and not have anyone to step in and give you any production. There was a lot of money paid for him. He's the Rings Hoth American Player of the Year for a reason. I expect it for him to have a little bit more quality in some of the stuff he's doing on the pitch more consistently. Yes, Again, yeah. that he, will he come is, with time. Yeah, and that will come with time. Yes, he is uh, falling on the pitch and going to ground very easily. His crossing is pretty wayward at times. Yes, again, he had the two good passes there, but yes. in the first half... On the whole. Full. Yeah, on the whole, uh, in the beginning, in, in the first half, yes, it was not fantastic. Uh, but I think uh, you see glimpses of what he's able to do. I mean, his first touch is still is ridiculous. very, very good. I mean, people will ping a ball as hard as they can into him. It would just drop down right in front of him. His, his like, technical ability is insane. Exactly. Which is why I expect him to start doing some things for Atlanta United. Because what Carlos Vela is doing for LAFC yeah. is what PC Martinez can do for Atlanta United. Yeah, but Maybe it, he just needs that confidence, time. but... Because Carlos Vela has also had a season here. Yes. Uh, and so that definitely helps. And, you know, kind of under the system, under the same manager, uh, with the same or similar players... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's a little easier to see he, Carlos Vela and get why he's doing what he's doing. And plus, he's also in incredible form, and so that's, you know, also helpful. But, um, yeah, in, and in terms of, uh, you know, the rest of this match, I mean, it's just, you know, it's it ends 1-0, of course. And, you know, in terms of the grand scheme of things, it's not the prettiest of wins, but I think still at, three the, points. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's... Uh, something to build on. It's something where, um, yeah, I mean, it's sorely needed. We're out of last place. And, yeah, it's something that, yeah, we just got to keep looking forward. Um, yes, is it uh, still a lot of questions and a lot of problems that uh, need to be answered? Yes. There's still a lot that's left to be desired. That's yeah. Absurd. It doesn't quell everything. And it really hasn't, of course. But I think... Uh, at the very least, you know, like it gets one monkey off her back and I think we need to kind of take one step at a time right here because it's hard to, we're not going to jump right back in the first place after, you know, one, one no, match. It's but if you win gonna... your games in hand, you could be tied, which is the absolutely crazy thing. Which is, is crazy, yeah. Atlanta has three games in hand on the teams <laughs> in first place in the East. Yeah. If they won all three, they'd be tied. Yeah. That's ridiculous. It is. So speaks to the the quality or lack of quality in the East right now, at least in terms yeah. of how everybody's playing. But uh, let's get to the post match quotes. And yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, Frank de Boer, he talked about the uh, the tactical approach, uh, and with PT Martinez, yeah, he pretty much talked about how PT was the number ten tonight. Uh, and I think for me, uh, yeah. He needs to probably see that a little bit more because, you know, a Barco might be going to the U-20s with Argentina. You might see uh, some of the understudies, Andrew Carlton, go away with the U.S. youth national team for the U-20s. Um, yeah, I mean, and PT also might, uh, you know, go There's to Argentina. a lot of international competitions happening but, right now. But uh, I think... You know, we, we might not see PT uh, go because there might be a few more number 10s that... Uh, it is Argentina. So. Yeah. There is a, there's a lot more selection uh, headaches. They don't, they don't uh, lack for quality in attack. Yeah. The so, other side, mm, yeah, not so and, much. Yeah. <laughs> and so in terms of that, we don't necessarily have to let him go or let them go. But I think uh, in the case of an Ezekiel Barco, I mean... He's pretty much their key cog, probably. So it probably is going to be a case where we're probably going to be missing him. So in terms of that, playing PT as the number 10 probably is wise. Like, we probably will need to see him uh, connect with a Joseph Martinez a lot more because we, we will need it. We will need that creativity from the middle. And if it's not him, then maybe it's a Jonathan Nagby. But either way, uh, I get why PT was played in the 10. Yes, it took away from Ezekiel Barker and what he's able to do. Ezekiel Barker has been playing yeah. very well in the 10. And exactly. he was a lot quieter having played on the left today. Exactly. So, I mean, not today, but on match day. So right. there's got to be a balance to be struck there. And exactly. I think the 4 2 3 1 offers a lot of flexibility to mm -hmm. Frank De Boer. I think that... And they're going to interchange anyway. Yeah, that's the thing. Is so, I think that it would... Me personally, I, I think dream scenario as a front four would be Tito on the left, uh, Ezekiel Barco in the middle, and PT on the right, giving the guys the ability to cut in on their strong feet. But where also, does Russell play? That's the thing, is that at the end of the day, if we're being honest, 
as good as Gressel is, is he technically better than any of those three players? But in terms of who scored the, uh, oh, I who know, scored the goal? Oh, I know, I know. I'm so saying it's tough, at, man. At their, at their height. Yeah. But also, I still believe that against a team like, say, Colorado, you can get away with playing Gressel at right back because they're not really attacking. So why not give yourself that attacking option mm -hmm. and create those overlaps and those overloads on the wings because he's shown that he has the ability to do that. And when you're playing against a team like Colorado, your fullbacks function more like wingbacks anyway because their starting position is so high up the pitch so you can afford to be more aggressive. Yeah. And I think that's something that could be thought of mm -hmm. and maybe it can help you break teams down that give that sit so deep because you have more attacking quality mm -hmm. on the pitch. Yeah. So. That's just an idea, in my opinion. Right. And okay, so uh, Frog de Boer also talked about adjustments that PT Martinez needs to make. He says, I think he has to get stronger physically. Then he can deal with the other things that I mentioned previously. If he gets back to a full 100%, because in my point of view, he isn't quite 100% yet. If he comes to that, he will get there. It takes time. I'm convinced that when he gets to 100%, we're going to see a difference and have a lot of fun with him. I like the sound of that. Yeah, and uh, I, I definitely agree that yeah, he isn't, he doesn't look fully fit, uh, at least match fit. He doesn't look, um, he's not maybe used to getting the non-calls that he's getting here because I think in other leagues, he gets a little bit more protected because the technical players are definitely uh, more lauded there. Uh, and in here, I mean, yes, it is physical. It's kind of uh, like a Premier League in one sense in how kind of physical and uh, maybe, to a lesser degree, uh, the intensity maybe, uh, from some of the some of the players and positions on the pitch. But uh, in terms of P.T. Martinez, yes, I still think, yes, he's going to ground a little too easily. If he, uh, yeah, stays on his feet a little bit easier and goes into the box a little bit more, where if he does, you know, go to ground in the box, then he really asks questions of the ref to make that decision. And I think, you know, also with losing, or not losing, but uh, having in the stat category, the fewest penalties called, I, I believe, still so far uh, for Atlanta United, like we desperately need that as well. You gotta that was get a, into the box in order yeah. to draw penalties though, and that's yeah. not something this team is doing. But I agree exactly. with you, he's so good on we the ball, on the dribble, and Ezekiel Barco as well. Mm -hmm. Technically, if they can drive at people, even if a team's sitting deep, if they can play a one-two, try to move the ball around quicker, get into the box, and then if they do get fouled, yes, like you said, you make the referee ask questions, and then mm -hmm. if you do that, you're gonna get some calls to go your way. Again, you also have VAR if that works, but you, you still yep. put the officials in a position where, or in the, the opposition in a position where, mm -hmm. do you foul? Do you yep. go in on a tackle? Because you know this player is going to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's these professional aspects of the game that players are good at and drawing fouls going down. It's the whole thing. But mm -hmm. again, there, there's more to come. I really want to see it from him. I still have to believe that he can do it. Mm -hmm. It's again, I'm giving Frank DeBoer a pass on in terms of the number of matches. So it's only fair if I give it to PT as well because it's mm -hmm. not been an easy adjustment period. But that being said, I still think it's fair for fans to expect more. And I still think it's oh, fair absolutely. for fans to anticipate these things happening sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of what PT uh, you know, should and could offer, yes, I mean, our expectations should be high high and higher because yeah, you know, of the, the plots that he has, of the, you know, the uh, South American Player of the Year award that he has under his toe. His resume is, uh, you know, it speaks for itself and people want to see that. You know, there are, uh, like we pointed out, um, you know, some of the, the crosses that are wayward uh, that make you scratch your head. But I think that's where, you know, it's just him trying to maybe dial it back. And also, that, that is where it's, you know, a lot of his shots are coming from distance and not inside the box. And so those are lower quality chances, uh, lower percentage chances. And so, you know, the likelihood of him probably scoring when he's shooting from out there, yes, he has the shot to be able to do it, but you know, it, it's just, it, the likelihood is lower. And so, yeah. you know, he needs to get himself in better positions to get better chances so that it, it, the percentages aren't against him. Absolutely. The other thing though that kind of speaks to his talent though is his teammates still think very highly of him. Yeah. Darlington Nagby had this to say after the match, Every time I get the ball, I'm looking for PT Martinez. Obviously, we want to get our talented guys, our playmaker, our number 10 on the ball. 
We know what he can do, we have seen him in training, and we have seen him at River Plate. I think he is just getting started here. I am confident in him, and I am going to give him the ball every single time, and it is just a matter of time before everyone can see what he can do. And that, that mm -hmm. sentiment was echoed by almost all of his teammates, whether it be yep. LGP, Julian Gressel, the coach, all of them believe in him. So again, is it frustrating right now? Yes. Am I frustrated right now? Absolutely. But clearly he's a player that has the talent. Yeah. He has the ability and it's just gonna be that moment when it clicks. And yeah. I think when it starts clicking for him, that might be when things start clicking for Atlanta United yeah. as well. But obviously again, sooner rather than later, especially sure. with the month of May that Atlanta United has, it would be nice with seven matches for them to finally exactly. figure their things out and start putting points on the board because- With the fixture congestion, it's gonna be very, very important. You'll be half, almost halfway through the season. Well, yeah. you will be halfway through the season mm -hmm. pretty much by the end of this month. So at that point, it's really fair to start making assessments on what these guys are doing. This is a big month coming up. So mm -hmm. this talk is nice and it's good to hear that they have confidence in him, yep. but the performances need to start accompanying the results and they have to start going together for what is going to be a very critical month for this season. Yeah, just uh, I think slightly under uh, half a season. It would be probably about 40% or something like that. It's like, I think 14, 15 A big games. enough chunk to be but, able to make an assessment on how things are going. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But uh, guys, that wraps up the Colorado Rapids match and let's get into the news where, yes, Dunnington Nagby, uh, yeah, I mean, with that assist and just the his performance general, in general play. 94% I mean, pass completion yeah. and he played the full 90, I mean. Yeah, and then his work rate throughout the match, I mean, uh, key passes, I mean, yeah, he was uh, voted onto the MLS Team of the Week. What would we do without Darlington Nagby right now? Because yeah, right New now, England, oh. he was really good. I mean, in general, he's a key cog, he's right a key cog for us moving the ball. Yeah, and, but I think, uh, you know, in terms of that, like, you know, uh, the final ball hasn't always been there for him. Uh, but I think this month, it's been a lot more, and I think it finishes off with this, um, you know, with the assist to Gressel. And I think if we can see more of that controlled chaos, I think. Uh, was that his first assist ever for Atlanta United? No. But, uh, what was it? Because he didn't have an assist last season. Did he have? Or no, he didn't have a goal, but he did have. Uh, I think did a he? couple of assists last season. Yeah, uh, yeah. He didn't fill up the stat sheet last season, but it is. He had that one is. goal rolled off for offside against NYCFC, exactly. which was really frustrating. Yeah, but uh, and I think you know, speaking on that, it's uh, we we see less of VAR in our matches now, which is very interesting. It's because, a lot different from last season. Yeah, because we almost saw it like two or three times every match. It's really annoying. Uh, but I think. The difference was was how much chaos we were causing, and especially in or probably Around just mostly the in the box. I think uh, how many times, yeah, we got penalties called for us or uh, penalties called off, whatever it was. Yeah, I, you know, there were a lot more chances. Uh, you know, I think there were in more dangerous areas, and so that's why VAR came into play a lot more. And I think if we can get more, uh, you know, dangerous chances, then I think. We all have our old friend back of uh, VAR, but hopefully that's when we're actually, you know, on the good side of those calls. And getting into an interesting stat about PT Martinez, his expected assist leads all of MLS players except for Alejandro Pozuelo. Of, that guy is balling. Yeah, for Toronto FC, and that's per analysis evolved that great uh, Twitter handle. And um, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting. Basically saying like, that he should have a lot more assists than what he has. Yeah, and so if you know our players got on the end of his balls, then yeah, I mean, he would actually have an assist and have, uh, you know, maybe Joseph would have a few more goals. And that stat probably belongs right next to expected goals, which Atlanta it's true. should have a lot more of apparently. But I mean, yeah. it's, it's still like that. It's the lack of form, it's the lack of uh, you know confidence that our team is in. It's just you maybe know, I'm the way it goes. It's hard headed or old school, but like yeah. there's only so much I can put into expected because it's like mm -hmm. yeah, expected, but like eh, you but know what I mean like expected goals can kind of add up and yes, and, it's to a degree though. I mean you, you think about uh, how many chances Joseph Martinez has put away and you know what he's expected to do here. I mean I think it's a little bit more in line with um, you know especially also with the chances that that were. I mean, you know, if you look at that ball, like we were saying earlier, uh, from PT Martinez, that uh, Joseph Martinez could have, uh, you know, he was got sliding, on the end of. yeah, got on the end of because he was sliding onto the end of 
Um, you know, that's another one. There's definitely a few times this season where it was, yeah, a little bit pretty clear cut if someone had gotten on the end of it. It really, like, those are the chances that they were talking about. So it's not just like every single ball that's pumped into the box, oh, you know, that's an expected chance. So, um, but anyway, moving on from that, uh, American soccer analysis. Has Atlanta United their playoff odds at 71.6%? Uh, and that takes into account also uh, the form of last year and also, uh, you know, what they're maybe expected to do. And so, you know, 71% chance uh, or 72% I mean, chance if you round up. It should be 100%. This team is way <laughs> too talented to not be making the playoffs. Sure. And I think that if this team can find its form, then it mm -hmm. will not be a problem and it will be a 100% chance of making the playoffs. Sure. But again, that assessment will be able to be made, in my opinion, at the end of this month, depending on how these next seven matches go. So Very true. But uh, yeah, you look at the rest of that chart and the likes of New York Red Bulls also have have a 70% chance and Philadelphia actually have a 84% chance which is incredible um, you also so, have LAFC pretty much running with everything yeah because exactly. <laughs> I mean and also you yeah, have you look at their goal difference it's just yeah you know they've been blowing away teams and they've been yeah they they look to me like an MLS Cup winning side at the moment but the it's moment. still May and so there's a lot of things that can happen exactly. and if that team say lost to Carlos Vela Yep. Could they still be performing at that high of a level? I don't know, because that yeah. man's going full messy on Major League Soccer right yep. now. So To be fair, a lot of people said that about a Miguel Miron or Jose Martinez, and so, you know. We'll same, see, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Uh, mm -hmm. Another interesting bit that'll kind of make fans reminisce and tingle is that Tata Martino was in Atlanta on Monday to hype up Mexico versus Venezuela. He's had some interesting things to say and some things that um made me feel really, really regretful that he's gone. He said I always say that if I would have been a coach here 10 years earlier, I probably would have remained living in Atlanta, which is the biggest compliment I can give the city. So yeah, I miss it. Someone's cutting <sighs> onions, man. And uh, so in terms of that, you know, Tata, yeah. Uh, you know, of course there's a, a large part of the fan base that are pining for Tata Martino to come back it's or for Frank DeBoer to be fired. Uh, also not gonna that. happen. Yeah, you, you have just, yeah. I mean, you know, he's talking well about uh, the city. Of course, why wouldn't he? He no doubt enjoyed his time here. Um, and, you know, he also lauded Franck de Boer. And because also, I think it's probably the, you know, uh, head coach or manager kind of uh, society union. union yeah. yeah, where you just don't, you know, you don't rag on another. It, uh, it wouldn't look good on his part. Exactly. If he was just like Franck de Boer shit. Yeah, like, exactly. His. Uh, Especially his, you know, um, his successor, like, you know, uh, especially when he doesn't have any ill will towards any of it. I mean, if he, it was a Jose Mourinho. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a bit different. Yeah, that's a, a different scenario. But, um, you know, he talked about how... Can you imagine Jose Mourinho managing an MLS? People, people are pining for it, and it's very no. weird to me. It's no, very no, weird just no. Because... No, no, no. You know where he belongs? <laughs> he belongs to that team in Florida. That's where he'd be great. That's where he'd be great. Like, genuinely. That oh would God. be a match made in hell. I, I just don't even want to see... Like, I already hate both of them. I hate Jose Mourinho and so much. I It, it would just make me hate <laughs> that team in Florida even more. It would be insane. They could have I don't, up Miami I with how everything's going with that franchise. Uh, I don't want to hate Miami, but, I mean, there are if some... If he goes that... anywhere, you'll just immediately <laughs> hate them. I think I will as well. Yes. So that's fair. But, He's uh, going to independent MLS. Just yeah. Watch. So he, <laughs> no, I don't know. But uh, he talked about Frank DeBoer and saying he has a top resume and he's definitely a step up for Atlanta United. He also talked about how he was known for his playing career at Barcelona yep. and with the Netherlands and with Ajax. Mm -hmm. So he spoke very highly of our current manager. Yeah. Again, he was always going to do that. Giving him the backing might, maybe coming from Tata might help a little bit of fans ease things a little bit. I don't know. I think yeah. results will go more the way of that. But still at the same time, it's good to see Tata back in Atlanta and that match will be in, against Venezuela at the beginning of June at the Benz. I will hopefully be going to that. I'm pretty sure you hopefully be going to that. I probably will not oh. be able to make that. Oh, uh, no. you know, funds are tight, you know, oh. so well, I, I won't be able if to. If things but. work out, I know a lot of people will be at that. There'll be right. a lot of Atlanta United shirts there. I think it's already sold out, so man, I don't know. You might have to get it off the secondary market, but 
Either way, it's gonna be a hell of a time. It'll be good to see Tata Martino in Atlanta at Mercedes-Benz Stadium and the little matchup with Joseph Martinez maybe as well, and that'd be a lot of fun. But Indeed. speaking up of matchups, Atlanta's game at LAFC has actually been moved. If you have not seen the news already, it was originally on a Saturday and it has now been moved to Friday, July 26th from the Saturday the 27th and kickoff will be at 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 p.m. Eastern time. So if you are going to that game, probably need to get on those travel adjustments and see if you can move stuff around. Rather annoying, but unfortunately, these things do tend to happen in soccer. Indeed, indeed. Uh, but uh, Ford wingback Gordon Wild is, uh, at least according to his Instagram, he is getting a green card and he's going, he's missing uh, pretty much a week of soccer and going back to Germany. Uh, and so that bodes well because, yeah, he's a guy that could figure into the plans a little bit more and maybe this has been holding it back a little bit and also opening up an international slot is always good for Atlanta United. Those Atlanta United lawyers, man. Finding Indeed. green cards for everyone. Exactly. Maybe this can open up uh, a slot maybe for a Anderson Osiedu, maybe. That'd you know? be nice. Who knows? Uh, we need that midfield depth because, yeah, Kevin there Kratz, is none. Oh, man, like, he's been missing the entire season, essentially. Like, that's, he's another cog in our There's midfield. There's three midfielders. Yeah. That's it. And like, they mostly play all every game. <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> not good! Yeah. So, we definitely need that depth. But, um, yeah, guys, uh, also, our Facebook, uh, yeah, check it out on the, uh, the description box below because, uh, yeah, we're building up that uh that um you New know follower page. count again and you know we desperately need your help to be able to uh get that reach again but uh you know we appreciate all the uh the engagement that you guys give us it really means a lot to us every single day and so you know continue to share it around with your friends and uh you know we want to get it back to the healthy levels that we had it before uh, and also, yeah, in, in honor of Avengers Endgame, the biggest movie in the world right now, uh, yeah, go ahead and cop that Joseph V. Thanos, or, you know, X Thanos, uh, shirt that, uh, you know, we had selling last year, but, um, you know, if you haven't copped it, you know, now is a perfect time, because it's so timely, it's the biggest movie in the world. Do it. I was more concerned about Game of Thrones than the Battle for Winterfell personally. That's probably true. There's a, yeah, a couple of uh, geeky things for a lot of people. A about. lot of important people in film <laughs> died this past weekend. And that too, yeah, exactly. They'll probably all start hopping over to Marvel movies and uh, <laughs> oh God. just happens, oh just God. happens. I but I know, right? Yeah, so, all right. Uh, moving on to Atlanta United 2. Unfortunately, they took a couple of losses uh, this past week. Uh, they lost 4-1 against Tampa Bay Rowdies. It was a lot closer than that uh, for most of the match, but uh, they, you know, it was just an open match at the end of it. And uh, but it was still the first goal in red, black, and gold for Luis Nascimento. And uh, you know, so congrats to his MLS or not his MLS, his USL, uh, you know, debut goal. And also a debut for Bienvenue Kana Kiamana. Yeah. I uh, did about as well as that has been going to. He made yeah. his debut against the Bay Rowdies as well, so good for him to get his first appearance for the red, black, and gold of Atlanta added to. Indeed. And uh, unfortunately, they took the other L, and it was a 2-0 loss against Ottawa Fury. Uh, yeah, we saw the likes of Jackson Conway start up top, and yeah, I mean, I think it's also, you know, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, good feels early. Now we're going against some tougher competition, and so uh, it's really about them figuring it out at Atlanta A2. But uh, also, uh, you know, with that meme, it's gonna be me. <laughs> it's gonna be me. Oh god. Uh, oh dear <laughs> Sorry. god. Sorry guys. Uh, but uh, they, you know, are having May 4th, uh, the Star Wars night for Atlanta A2, at the Kennesaw Stadium. So uh, if you're able to make it out, it should be probably fun. But uh, guys, that does it for the news and gets us to the mailbag. You guys send in these questions through IG story and in this case, uh, some of it through Facebook DM as well, but continue to do so and we could answer your question in the future. First question comes from Kakis27 on Instagram. Do you think the front office should have done better in the off season acquiring players? Yes. Yeah, unequivocally yes, but yes, there are MLS salary restrictions that, that have made it difficult to get that, uh, you know, depth at certain positions that we probably needed midfield, 
fullback. Um, yeah, I mean, could they have done better? I think they knew that they probably needed to do better, but, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing for me is that fullback position where they didn't find a warm body that can at least defend the position because that's kind of been a hindrance in why we had to play three men in the back. I think, uh, you know, that's something at least that could have been done. But the next question comes from uh, Instagram me, Tony. If you have to pick from either Miguel Miron, Tata Martino, or Andre 3000 to hammer the golden spike this season, who would it be and why? Lastly, who would get the best ovation? Miggy would get the best ovation. I'm just this saying. Is, this is absolutely very, very difficult for me to answer. I, I know this is very difficult for you. Miggy would get the best ovation only because there is a large percentage of the fan base that probably doesn't know who Andre 3000 is. I know that sounds criminal, <laughs> but looking at the, the, the demographics, there's a lot of people who, they would just be like, oh, Miggy, yay. I know who Andre 3000 is, and I know what he means to you, so I'm gonna let you have your piece, but in terms yeah. of loudest ovation, I'm gonna answer that one and say Miggy would get the loudest ovation. Yeah. Uh, for me, I mean, okay, I love Miguel Miron. I love Tata Martino. But this is decades-long love of Andre 3000. I have to go with Andre 3000. Oh, yeah, I in mean, terms just, of, like, the swag yeah. of hitting, yes. He would, <laughs> uh, yes, that would be an incredible person to have hit that spike. Yeah, he has to hit the spike for me. I At mean, some he's point in time, he will, missing. right? Like, uh, I, I mean, he, he's been missing from the public for a while as well, so it's kind of one of those things, like, he doesn't really want to go That's out fair. really and so you know as uh, much as big boy has been out uh making music and touring and whatnot it's Jack been the antithesis the for andre 3000 almost pretty much except for their kind of reunion tour they did uh together uh with outcast but uh in terms of the best ovation i mean for me i would probably cheer the loudest for andre 3000 but uh i mean Obviously, you know, Miguel Miron and Tata Martino, if they hit the spike, which Tata Martino was kind of talking about, like, yeah, he would probably come. I'd love for him to do it. To, uh, as hit long the, as he had the sweater over his back as well. I know, That's exactly. important. Oh, if he doesn't God. have that over his back, then is he really doing it right? Yeah, and he's got to let, uh, or, you know, he's got to announce when he's coming because you want to see the entire supporter section with the uh, the sweater around the next. Oh, yeah. Because, man, that, that would be scenes. But, uh, of course, for me, though, you know, they would get super large and loud receptions from me anyway. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, next question comes from Facebook with Mitchell McGirt. Hello, AUFTV. Love the content and personalities on the fan TV. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, question that perhaps y'all can answer for me in the next Five Stripes Weekly. How can AUFC improve upon its set pieces? They have never, apart from Kratz dialing up laser-guided shots against Montreal, looked very dangerous from free kicks or corners, especially. With all these poor teams shit-housing the shit out of them and bunkering down every match, what do y'all suggest United to? What do y'all suggest United do to improve set-piece play? How much time is spent on that aspect of the game on the training ground, typically? That's a great question. Also, I love the uh, description of how teams play against us. Spot on. Fully endorse that. Yeah. Um, I think Ezekiel Barco's actually been taking some very good free kicks so far. He this wasn't season. as much last year because, yeah, he had to pretty much defer to yeah. a Miguel Miron or a Joseph Martinez. Or a Kevin Kratz if he was on. Yeah. I mean, but I thought Ezekiel Barco's been taking some really good set pieces. PT Martinez is also very good on set pieces, and he offers you an alternative foot from Ezekiel Barco. So mm -hmm. I think. If he can, you know, find his quality and find his confidence, mm -hmm. they offer you dangerous dead ball delivery from any situation, whether it be a corner, a direct free kick, you know, a free kick out wide. I think both of them have the quality to put dangerous balls into the box. In terms of actual practicing set pieces, in terms of the, you know, direct and the shooting, that comes down more to player and their individual training and something and that they what want. they might do after the training exactly what over. they practice on after training. And in terms of maybe set piece routines, that comes down to the individual coaches. Some mm -hmm. coaches spend a lot more time on set pieces because they think that that's their best way of scoring. Mm -hmm. Other coaches don't put as much time into it because that's not the focus of their game plan. I don't think Frank DeBoer is a guy that probably focuses a lot on set pieces because that's not where he thinks he can create the most chances uh, for his team. Usually the teams that struggle creating through open play will be the teams that practice and have a lot of set piece routines because 
that's their best chance of getting a dangerous ball into the box and creating a goal scoring opportunity. Right, but I do agree, yes, with all of the shithousery that goes on against us. Uh, and if we do get you know, a free kick in a really good position, yes, we have the players that can do it, especially this year. You have a Miles Robinson, you have an LGP, you know, you have a Jeff Lerowitz when he's playing, even Julian Gressel, Joseph and of Martinez. course, Joseph Martinez. <laughs> You have enough guys that can win a header and maybe a, even a secondary header uh, to be able to, you know, uh, kit it into the back of the net. And that's what we need. And maybe even, uh, uh, you know, not even to a meaty forehead. It could be, you know, a uh, uh, front post type of, uh, you know, free kick as well. Or, you or know, a flick on, or as we saw quarter. in the MLS Cup final, where you have exactly. Joseph Martinez flicking onto the back post yeah. for, for a fr uh, Franco Escobar sliding into the back post. Right. So I think it just comes with time mm -hmm. and uh, getting Confidence. Used is I mean, if, if Ezekiel Barco and PC Martinez are both fully confident and this team is playing well and in full flow and creating chances, they'll be drawing a lot of dangerous free kicks on the edge of the area. And if both of them are confident in hitting them and able to put them on frame, that makes it very difficult for the goalkeeper because he doesn't know which direction it's going to come from, which way it's going to bend. That enables you to do, you know, guys stepping over the ball, running over the ball, doing things to move the defense around and make it more unpredictable. But that comes with confidence as well, which this team is clearly lacking right now. Definitely. And uh, yeah, all it takes is one, uh, you know, a goalkeeper leaning the wrong way. And, you know, if a guy can hit it with precision, there it is. It could go in, uh, you know, in a top corner or even kind of near on the, on you know, in the middle of the net where, yeah, it could just, it. there's a lot more possibilities with the confidence. So uh, next question comes from Bosnak Almeiden. What would happen if we played five at the back? Would that affect anything? I mean, essentially, like... Yes and no. Yeah. I mean, we sometimes play with three at the back and, you know, with uh, the, you know, wing backs that come back. That's essentially five at the back if we're sitting deep and defending. But generally, I mean, I don't think we really need more defenders on the pitch right now. For us, uh, against kind of the likes of a Colorado Rapids, we really don't need that. Yes, we did see a Parkers come on later and uh, that's, you know, was to shore up a 1-0 lead. But I think generally, you know, if we're playing kind of a, a team that we know that we're probably going to uh, possess more than they are, we probably shouldn't, but no that doesn't to pull mean- pull another person from midfield exactly. or so to put them in That defense. could be in attack, you know, and, but, there is the thing that uh, Frank de Boer is a little bit, you know, just slightly more defensive minded in that sense where, uh, but that's probably more through possession. But, you know, kind of some safe possession and recycling uh, all of that, that's usually kind of more with the, uh, the defenders, unfortunately. Yeah. And, so, and it also comes down to, you know, the personnel that you have available to right. you, whether you have injuries or not, which was kind of the reason why he, he talked about playing a back three at the beginning right. of the season. And it also has something to do with the opposition. You know, yeah. if you feel that the opposition may outpossess you or may be more attacking mm -hmm. and you want to be a bit more compact in defense, then yes, a three at the back makes sense. But, you know, you have to remember that when you do play a three at the back, you are pulling a player from a position higher at the pitch, whether it be in midfield or an attack. And right now at Atlanta, it has a lot of attacking options. So pulling a player from that to put them in defense is kind of robbing you of maybe a bit more goal scoring. Now, mind you, Atlanta had played a three at the back system in route to winning the MLS Cup last season. That team functioned a little bit different tactically, which is why that worked. And you also had a player like Miguel Almiron, who was able to stretch the play from the middle of the park. And you maybe don't necessarily have that type of player right now. Right. Next question comes from I Langley. What can help Joseph and PT bond quickly? Video games, ropes course with trust balls. It's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, in terms of time. Yeah, getting them to bond. I think it's time on the pitch together. Really, that's really what probably will solve a lot. Um, but it's also yeah, in training. Uh, yeah, I think you know you'll see that a lot more. Um, you know. Like they'll probably be able to, if they're being at least played together in those, uh, you know, those kind of maybe 5v5s or uh, 7v7s or whatnot, uh, then yeah, I mean, you know, you'll be able to see them get more time on the pitch together. But I think what's the probably most important is, yeah, to, to realize it's never gonna be like a Joseph and Miggy situation. Uh, you know, Joseph pretty much said that Miggy's like his brother. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the difference is that PT 
Um, yeah, he probably, and like uh, you know, the other people post match have said that he's probably going to be more of a facilitator, and maybe it you know might not be directly towards Ajos Martinez because in the system he is a little bit more of kind of uh, you know. Unfortunately, he's kind of more of a target forward in this. He has to do more of a, kind of the target forward things instead of what he's used to doing last he's, year. He's, I think right now, if I can make, a, I hate doing this and people have pointed it out, but they're really good at it, so this is why I'm doing it. But when Pep Guardiola went to Manchester City, he did not have a good start with Sergio Aguero no. because people wondered if Sergio Aguero could function in this role. He very much functions in that role now, but it took time for him to figure out how he fit into that system and how he was going to play. Mm -hmm. I think it's very much the same with Joseph Martinez and Frank DeBoer, where both need to figure the other one out and figure out how they best fit into the system. And I think it's one of those things with Atlanta United where they're kind of learning a lot and something that's very, a lot more detail oriented than what Tata Martino had them doing. And that does take time. The system does take time. And PT Martinez and Joseph, that connection I think will take time because of how DeBoer wants them to play. So I think it will take time for them to figure that stuff out and it's going to be one of those things that if and when it clicks, it should click and go zero to 100 very quickly for them I think where they mm -hmm. now know where they're going, where they learn the passing patterns, where they learn the movement patterns that this system requires for them to make. But again, that's one of those things that takes time. I get that that's frustrating. I'm frustrated by it as well. But we got to hope that's what's going to happen at some point in time and that when it does, we will see this team scoring goals and Joseph Martinez and PT Martinez linking up for some really, really quality goals for Atlanta United. Indeed. Last question comes from Sal Martelli, 22. Should we switch back to Black Sox? Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, are you like superstitious? I, I, I am. I, so I, yes. I sense a little bit of superstition here. Um, Do it. But I think, uh, you know, I think it's with the uniform like it's a little bit more right. black. It's a, it's almost too much black. All black everything. Like, <laughs> just do it. If if it was already all black, then sure. But I think I, I'm fine with the way it looks. I'm not really worried about hey, that. Hey, what do we have to lose at this point? I'm all for it. I'm That's all not for the it. reason why we're in bad form. But or is it? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? And guys, that gets us to the match preview, and it's this Sunday at Children's Mercy Park against Sporting KC. It's a late one, and yeah, I mean, uh, Sporting Very KC. Very tough place to go and play. Yeah, Isn't it the definitely. blue, do they call it the blue hell? Is yeah, that welcome to the blue hell. Mm. That is them, and uh, yeah, they're not in the best of form. They're they like us right now. Yeah, but they've had a lot of draws. Uh, five, I think, in fact, or four in the last Six. They had a pretty wild game last week. They a did. 4 4 draw with New England. That saw New England have two players sent off. Haven't seen that anywhere before. Yeah, that's massive. Yeah, I think uh, New England, they tend to get some players sent off. They, uh, they, enjoy, yeah. a good, they enjoy a good red card. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, and you know, it's uh, one of those uh, where we have drawn them. In 2017, we in 2018, of course, took that 2-0 loss. That game was really, really annoying. Yeah, one of the most annoying matches. Uh, that that was a stupid disallowing of that goal. Yeah. I will, mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's not fantastic in terms of odds. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, bet 365, they have SKC to win at one to one, so 50 percent uh, at. For a draw, it's 12 to 5 at 29.4%, and Atlanta to win at 11 to 4 at 26.7%. So, not fantastic, but uh, yeah, an interesting thing to note uh, is this from our buddy Toyota Football. Uh, he said on Twitter, the meeting between Atlanta United and Sporting Kansas City this Sunday is one of the rarest matchups you'll find. Two teams currently sitting below the playoff line who might be who might be two of the best teams in the league when it's all said and done. And, you know, it very well could be because, yeah, you look at that graph, it's, uh, yeah, I mean... They're very a very quality team. They were a yeah. team we talked about in our season preview that we expected a lot from them. I think they were they kind of suffering a bit like Atlanta United did and like Toronto did last season from that CONCACAF Champions yeah. League run. They got hammered by Monterey over two yeah. legs. That was really rough on them. That's going to mess with your confidence. You lose a top 
quality defender in the league in Ike Opara. He is now gone. So they've kind of struggled to figure out what they want to do, and they've struggled in defense, which has been one of the things that they have been so, so good at. I mean, they've given up eight goals in the last two games. A 4-4 draw with New England Revolution, and they lost four goals to one against San Jose Earthquakes, who are also a very poor team who are in the midst of a rebuilding process. So if you think Atlanta is having a tough season, Sporting Kansas City is right there with us. Yeah. It's shaping up to be a very interesting match because just like Atlanta United, Sporting Kansas City is looking for that match to really put a marker down and to get that performance and that result to kick on and start laying down points and mm -hmm. climbing their way up the Western Conference, which this year, as opposed to maybe last season, is very competitive. Yeah. So they're going to be coming out looking to set things right because yeah, they've been dropping points. They haven't been getting the results they've been needing to get. And that's gotta be really frustrating for both the players and their fan base. Right, and you know, for Sporting Kansas City, they are the type of team that also likes to possess the ball. A lot of similarities. And a lot of similarities and uh, yeah, they also, maybe lack a little bit of the width as well. They like to attack through the middle. And yeah, I mean, you know, uh, for us, you know, what they're really good at is kind of kind of uh, a little worrying as well sometimes because they're not only good at counterattacks, they're good at attacking the set pieces and shooting from direct free kicks. Uh, Basically, they put away their chances, unlike Atlanta yeah. United. Their yeah. problem has just been their defense has been leaking goals left, right, and center, but they still put goals in the back of the net. I mean, they... <laughs> It's ridiculous how many goals this team has scored despite being in poor form and not picking up results. Yeah, uh, in terms of that, I mean, it's like uh, SKC have scored at least two goals in their last seven home matches. Uh, yeah, there have been at least, there's under two and a half goals scored in eight of Atlanta United's last nine games. So that's kind so, of a immovable object, unstoppable right. force type thing. So that's another little interesting narrative. Right, yeah, I mean, you know, something's gotta give. The, the really <laughs> unnerving statistic is the fact that Sporting KC are undefeated in their last 11 home matches, or 11 sure. of 12 home matches. That's that's really disconcerting because Atlanta United have not been a very consistent road team so far this season, mm -hmm. or to be honest, well, I guess they were really good on the road last season, but on the whole, not been a great road team and not been in great form. This Sporting Kansas City team is scoring goals. It's shaping up to be what could be a very tough night for Atlanta United. Right. Uh, so, you know, our keys to the game, I think, is definitely we need to not concede early in the match. Uh, but it might be difficult because this is a team that, I mean, you know, this might be an fairly open game because we're both going to try to score. We're both going to try to possess the ball to play right. nice football. Exactly. And so, you know, uh, it, it is up to also our forwards to put away these chances that we're going to get. Can Joseph Martinez find his scoring boots? Because yeah. more likely than not, he will have a chance or two in this game. Yeah. And if Atlanta had want to get a result of any kind, he's going to have to be able to bury those chances right. when he gets them because Sporting Kansas City, like Atlanta United, mm -hmm. like you said, do try to possess the ball. Right. So for me, I'm curious to see which team, mm -hmm. if both teams try to go out and play that and possess the ball, or if one team says, you know, we're going to sit off a little bit yeah. and let you have the ball to give you that space. Mm -hmm. I'd feel more confident if it was a Tata Martina managed team that we'd be like, okay, you can have the ball a little bit more and mm -hmm. we're gonna hit you on the counter. That is not something that Frank DeBoer has in his locker, which makes me a bit concerned because well, does he have the ability to be a bit more pragmatic and allow his team yeah. to play on the break against a team that's probably gonna leave spaces at the back? Right, and it, it also depends on if, you know, a Frank DeBoer is going to want to press. And because a team like this that is, uh, so good at possession as well, you know, uh, it, it kind of will leave us a little bit and a little bit more open and could slice us open very, very easily. Uh, Alternatively just, though, yeah. they haven't been good at the back, so if you yeah. can get higher up the pitch and force mm -hmm. their defenders into making mistakes, then you might find some joy. For me personally, with how Atlanta had been playing this season, I think pressing would be a bit suicidal because I think if you can, if you go out and press, and I, I'm a guy that loves pressing, like that's the way that I think football should be played, especially in the modern game, is pressing. But with the form that Atlanta United are in, with the early defensive mistakes that Atlanta United and have allowed, and the lack allowed, of intensity and the you know not knowing what 
triggers there are for yes. most of the press. I think it would be mental to go out and try to press this team off the get-go yeah. because that's a way that you could ship an early goal. And I think if you ship an early goal to this team in their house, mm -hmm. when they're seeking to find form, that could be the start of a very lopsided scoreline against Atlanta United. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, some players to watch for SKC. They have a lot of them. Yeah, Johnny, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg for, for really that. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, they have their key guy right now is Johnny Russell with four goals, three assists, and uh, eight appearances so far. Uh, they're attacking midfielder, essentially. And John Luca Busio, their forward. Young guy. Young guy. Hasn't yeah. played well in their past couple of matches, yeah. but. He's been most effective coming off the bench as a mm -hmm. super sub, and he's still 16 years old, and he yeah. already has three goals and seven appearances this season. Yeah. And that's not to mention, mm -hmm. I'm gonna probably butcher this guy's name, but Christian Nimeth, who's got six goals and an assist in eight appearances this season as well. They also have a Graham Zuzi, a Tamilia. Yeah. They have a lot of very canny operators who have been around the league and are quality. They will be a team that, again, will take their chances if Atlanta had to present them to them. That is the danger for Atlanta United because they've gotten away maybe in, against some of these lesser teams like a Cincinnati or a Philadelphia or Colorado where they haven't been at their best, but they've either managed to draw or in the game against Colorado, a win. Mm -hmm. This is a team that's going to be more clinical than Dallas. Yeah. This is a team that's going to come at you more than Dallas. This is a team that if you are not prepared mentally and tactically, you can have another just absolute beatdown of which we haven't really gotten this year save Monterey or Herediano, but those matches are CONCACAF Champions League, so I don't really count. This could be a, say a Houston type situation mm -hmm. if Atlanta United is not prepared and ready for this match. Right, if we're not set up properly and if we're not uh, mentally in the, the right place before we uh, we take the pitch, and yeah, it could be, uh, could go a really, uh, really bad direction. So but, how do you see us setting up to yeah. prevent that well, from Before happening? we get into that though, let's uh, look at what the injuries uh, oh, you know, yes, so far, of what that uh, entails. Of course, Franco Esquire has gone back in the team. Uh, Eric Rometty has also come back uh, and he played a little bit, of course, last match. And then George Bello, uh, yes, you know, he was not in the squad this past match, but uh, is seemingly more and more fit every single day. And so uh, all those players come into play. So uh, we pretty much have, uh, you know, pretty much an available A squad. squad. Sands. Uh, you know, Brandon Vasquez, uh, Mikey Ambrose, and you know those with uh, longer-term injuries. But uh, yeah, f you know, I guess for that predicted eleven, I think for me, since you were asking me, um, yeah, I think it's a very similar four-two-three-one. Um, yeah, who's in between the six, of course, uh, Escobar, Robinson, LGP, and I think uh, Shea also as well. And uh, in the midfield. I think it's uh, Nagby and Remedi, so that uh, we have guys that can kind of chase down these kind of attacking midfielders that will be looking to create a little bit more. Even though I think Jeff Lerwitz has killed it as uh, you know coming in, and uh, he pretty much, I mean, he's just such just the uh, consistent reliable. wily veteran that just man so solid, so solid. And um, I think for this match. Uh, it's Gressel on the right, PT in the middle, because I think we still need to see more PT uh, in that 10, because, yeah, I mean, we have that match on Wednesday. Uh, you know, it will be a case where, you know, not every single player will be playing full 90s. They will be probably, you know, hopefully substituted earlier, maybe in the 60th minute. Uh, so, you know, it won't all be on them to completely uh, have to, you know, do every single little bit when they're on the pitch. Uh, and then Barco on the left. Um, yeah, it was, I still think, yes, I agree. Barco is probably best suited in the middle, but we need to blood in uh, PT as the 10 if we're going to be missing a Barco for a minute. Uh, and then Joseph up top. So uh, with that, that 4 2 three, one, I mean, yeah, I think uh, it allows for that uh, if we're going to you know, match toe to toe with SKC in terms of a little bit of that possession. We have uh, a little bit more ready, readily made triangles that can be uh, kind of moved higher up the pitch. Um, and yeah, 
it, like we, we said, and I agree, it would be suicidal to press, but uh, there are certain times and certain triggers that, yeah, maybe on a, a certain center back or two, you know, we can uh, press up higher and make some, some things happen, create some chaos, uh, at least when, yeah, we have guys back and uh, maybe, you know, it's, I, I think it, it bodes uh, where, you know, this is gonna be a tough match anyway. Like, I don't know if, you know, just the, the lineup is really going to, um, you know, create the winning formula for us because this is gonna be very, very hard, so. For me, it's been really difficult to figure out how Atlanta are gonna play in this game mm -hmm. because I, I don't think 4-3-3-1, personally, I don't think 4-3-3-1 is the best formation to go against what SKC will do. They've played both a 4-3-3 and a 4-1-4-1 this season, so they will have the midfield packed with talented guys who will seek to try to play the ball out wide and get those chances. <sighs> I think that Frank DeBoer almost has to play with the midfield three because the, the problem with the 4-2-3-1 is that if you're out, you can easily get outnumbered in midfield if those attacking midfielders don't put in the work rate to come back and defend. I don't think this is a game that suits PT Martinez very well. Mm -hmm. I think this is a game that suits uh, Tito Vijalba mm -hmm. very well because there I will agree. be space. For me personally, I. I just don't think Frank de Boer is going to do it. I, I don't know if he's going, for me, I think this is, to go kind of to, to a, a mailback question we had earlier, for me personally, this is the type of match where a back three makes a lot of sense. Mm. I think that you have to be able to defend, defend with width and be able to still have guys in the middle of the park in a system yeah. similar to how Atlanta United played last year. Will Frank de Boer do that? I don't think so. Because we don't have the personnel. No, so. we don't have the personnel. For me, I think I'd go with a 4-3-3. Back four, I agree with you on the same goalkeeper, obviously, Brad Guzan. I think mm -hmm. you have to play all three midfielders because you need Jeff Lerwinowitz to give you that defensive presence in the middle of the park. Mm -hmm. You need Darlington Nagby and you need Eric Hermetti's energy in the middle of the park to be able to match up mm -hmm. with those players because if they can control, if, if Sporting Kansas City overwhelms Atlanta United in the middle of the pitch and can control the game, Atlanta United are dead, in yeah. my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I think he has to have mid, a midfield three because PT Martinez is not going to give you that defensive mm -hmm. work. He is not going to track back. Mm -hmm. You will not get that work from him and mm -hmm. he will be a player that will be being carried, as yeah. will be Joseph Martinez. This is not a match where you can carry players. I think Tito Vijalba will start on the left. I think Julian Gressel will start on the right. I think Joseph Martinez will be up top. Okay. That means that both PT and Barco will be dropped from the starting 11. But that being said, I think those are two guys that can come off the bench and make a very big difference for you later in the match, especially if you need a goal. But, but, but that goal creation, that is, goal creation is going down, but, but you have to be smart because at the end of the day, the form book goes out the table with the Sporting Kansas City side. Mm -hmm. We are not playing good enough attacking wise to mm -hmm. justify putting those attacking players on the pitch. We are not going to win the possession battle against a team away from home if they don't want us to because yep. Sporting Kansas City are good enough. Sure. You have to be a bit more pragmatic and with Atito Vijalba, you have a player that if there is space, you mm -hmm. can play a ball to him and he is going to run at players and make them make mistakes. And with a team like Sporting Kansas City that has been making mistakes this season, mm -hmm. he's the perfect player to take advantage of that. As well as Joseph Martinez, the two of them can function very much like Atlanta did on the counter last year. Mm -hmm. Not to mention you will get the work rate from a Julian Agressel on the right, mm -hmm. as well as the crossing ability from him. And he also has the ability to tuck in the midfield if you need to be compact, or to drop back and defend a bit wider if you need him. You have to be hardworking this game against this team, even though they are in the form that they are in. You have to be smart about this. And I think that is the best way for Atlanta United to attack things, mm -hmm. especially with another midweek game at home where you can have both PT and Barco starting mm -hmm. again, and it saves them their legs for that match as well. So that's how I personally would attack it. Yeah. Whether or not that happens, it's, I don't know. I, I think you gotta have one or the other in terms of, uh, you know, if you're gonna do that, um, you know, as one of the tens, or I don't think you play. With and, the and, and, in this match. Yeah, exactly. But uh, as one of the the creative midfielders, rather, and so that's what uh, Darlington Nagby's for. He shows you that he can operate in those spaces, in and that if he sense. can get higher up the pitch, if he you can, can almost shift to in possession, having that four two three one with Darlington Nagby right. operating in that pseudo ten role, if he can getting forward put, and making things happen. Right. If you can put forth that final ball a little bit more often, which I mean, maybe this is the uh, run of form that gets him where he, you know, is. Uh, creating a lot more chances uh, that are finished, then okay, you know, that that's fantastic. But um, yeah, I think it's more about, for me, and why I pick a 4-2-3-1, is that, yeah, a Frank de Boer, 
you know, is he really going to, you know, just really eschew that offense completely? And no, he can still play his possession game, but I, th yeah, I personally think that if he sticks difficult. with that. Mm -hmm. He's he's having a player at the ten that's not going to give him the work rate that he needs because yeah. at the end of the day that's not the kind of player PT mm -hmm. Martinez is. Mm -hmm. He'd be playing an Ezekiel Barco who does not function well out wide in the wide spaces, which mm -hmm. is where the space is going to be against. Which it very well could Kansas you know City's if game. if it were if it switched. I mean PT still it would be hanging Shea out to dry and Shea already and that's a is problem. nuts. And Tito will give you that work rate on the left. Sure, but uh, you know I think you know we'll have to see because yeah that's. Uh, some interesting things in tow here. And that gets us to our score prediction. I'm not very optimistic about this one. Just something about Sporting Kansas City, our form against them, their home record. I think they're gonna win three goals to one for Atlanta. And I just think it's gonna be one of those games. I'm not gonna take too much from this. I don't think I'm gonna hold too much against Frank DeBoer unless he just comes out and does something stupid like say presses from the get go, we give up an early goal. But mm -hmm. for me, this match is kind of one of those where it's just, I don't think we match up well in this situation. I think Sporting Kansas City is a much better team than what their form suggests. And I just don't see this being a very eventful or very positive result for Atlanta mm. United. And that's not necessarily because I want that to happen or that I feel that like, yeah, you're just being it's realistic. Just, I'm just being realistic. This yeah. just doesn't, mm -hmm. for me, I think Sporting Kansas City has a positive result coming and I feel stronger about them putting down one than I do mm -hmm. about Atlanta United right now. Yeah, uh, and yeah, the odds are at least in, in favor. your favor <laughs> for that. But uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I think I'm a little bit more uh, you know, positive about this. I think that we can pull out our results. I think there are goals in this for sure. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, with SKC, they're probably gonna score two goals. But I hope that we can as well, and I think it ends in a 2-2 draw. And so, I dig it. Yeah, I think right right now at this point, you know, a 2-2 draw against one of the better, I think, uh, at least historically, uh, teams in the West, that's probably a good thing. So that gets us to our question of the day. And guys, with the month of April over and a May that is chock full of seven matches, what would be an acceptable place for Atlanta United to be in the Eastern Conference at the end of May? We're currently sitting in 10th. Do you think Atlanta United can get higher than that? Should we be challenging near the top? I mean, seven matches, that's 21 points. So get down in the comments below and let us know what you guys think. But well, guys, that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, smash that like button and share this video because it really does help us a lot. And for Tanner McLeod, I'm AJ. Thank you guys so much for watching. Oh,